the thing that stands out to me that I can say about you is you have this great curiosity, right? Of what food can do to fix your body, which in turn gave you this unique awareness and passion for health and well-being. Your story, your approach, your mindset, I believe was the key for your overall success. And you were proactively seeking what is best for you through a holistic way of healing mind, body, spirit, and all of that. You talk about energy as well, you know, taking matters into your own hands. I believe that your past experiences plays a huge role in all of this. And um, I'd like to talk story with you. My first question is, I guess, when did that curiosity started for you? I think I was born with it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. As, you know, um, I've always had an inquisitive mind. And also, you know, part of my story and my luck is that I was born in Italy and that my mom was very open-minded when I was a child. She definitely wanted to have more of a holistic approach to health and you know when I was a small baby wow. I got really sick and I had to take a lot of antibiotics and I almost died mm. and so I think after that my mom and I was born in 1968 so it's kind of like you know child of the 60s and I grew up in the 70s and things were like there was all this like interest in holistic medicine eastern medicine acupuncture and you know all those things so even in Italy it was like that and so one of my first doctors was an acupuncturist and a homeopathic doctor so after the antibiotic incident my mom I think really wanted to have a more holistic approach and so I remember getting acupuncture as a child you know maybe I was eight nine ten years old and already getting needles and then taking homeopathic remedies and you know my mom always tried to like feed me in a good way and was very lucky on that department because you know they yeah. my mom and my grandma had a restaurant so she learned how to cook from the Italian chefs and you know Italian food of course is very popular in the world for being like tasty good food and yeah. but it's also healthy yeah. at least it used to be mm -hmm. you know before a processed food came about even in Italy so yeah, all of these like really early experiences shaped my way of thinking. Wow. So I learned how to like question this establishment and I learned how to question, you know, the things that a doctor would tell you and like think for myself, do my own research. And, you know, I think that really helped me. And I am really grateful for that because like, you know, I'm 53 right now. And if you look at the average person here in the States at my age, they're taking like three, four, five different kinds of medication uh -huh. and, you know, struggling with their health, like vitality. And I see people like that every day. So I consider myself very fortunate. I'd never been on any medication in my life. And wow. still don't. <laughs> As a child learning how to fix you know, a plethora of reasons, maybe health reasons by through food and, you know, having your mom be open-minded with um, alternative medicine, such as, you know, you talked about acupuncture, which is a, I do it all the time for, um, you know, unblocking energy too. I talk, um, I, I'd love to talk about that later with you. Um, like many of us, we seek the alternative from the traditional healing. Um, I know you talk about education, educating yourself first. I also believe in my experience that um, some people may be only seeking out alternative medicine when their health situation becomes worse, becomes dire, becomes when, when the traditional medicine doesn't work for them anymore. First, I guess my question is, what has led you to your practice, whether your upbringing, I know you talked about your upbringing a little bit, um, or events in your life that has led you to this path of holistic healing. Um, mm -hmm. Do you remember the moment where you said enough of this? I know you've dabbled into paleo first, right? And yeah. then keto, paleo after. 
um, can you talk a little bit about that journey of mm-hmm. uh, finding this path? Yeah, so I honestly cannot take all the credit for starting, you know, my career or my journey with nutrition because um, I had an interest in healing and I was like trying to find my way to like ways, natural ways to heal my body. But then it's kind of like I got a big gift from the universe. I met a person who became my first mentor and she's a doctor of chiropractic. Dr. Deborah Penner in Chico. And we met and we became friends, like, you know, started getting acquainted. And very soon afterwards, she was like, you need to study nutrition and come work for me. And I was like, I don't know about that, but it sounds interesting. It's possible. We'll see. And she pushed me pretty hard. And I was like, okay, fine. You know, I was in a point in my life where I was ready for a career change. And what I was doing it was like I had worked, I had my own company. I was like working with artisans in, in Brazil and like indigenous people and artisans in Brazil, like creating crafts and importing crafts. Yeah. And like, it was all about sustainability and like preserving indigenous knowledge and all those great things. But it was still in a field that didn't resonate with me anymore, which was fashion. And I really felt like I was outgrowing that business and so it, she came in right at the right time. And I was like, wow, nutrition, helping people, you know, working with food, um, that all sounded like perfect for me. It just clicked. And so I started my certification course and yeah, the rest is kind of history. <laughs> so when, did, what did you, what diet were you doing at that time when you got uh, together with, with your uh, mentor? What 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 was the what diet? Was I eating? Yeah. Well, I was um, kind of eating just a normal diet, meaning like before I was not restricting my diet in any way. So I was still eating gluten. I was still eating a lot of sugar. Not a lot, you know. I never been like really addicted to sugar, uh, but I was eating a little bit of everything. And then right before I met her, I remember like trying to do a cleanse because I have had gallbladder disease since I was 27. And so for 10 years from 27 to 37, I met her when I was like 38 or 39, I think. No way, I was already 40. So it's been like 12 years of me managing gallbladder disease through supplementation. I worked with another chiropractor did nutrition so he gave me supplements but we never worked on my diet really and the supplements were not enough I was still having gallbladder attacks I didn't want to get my gallbladder cut out so I was really trying to find the right way of how to heal myself and the last thing I did was a raw food detox so I ate raw food for a month and making my own you know raw foods and like sprouting things and soaking nuts and you know, and that was okay. Like it actually helped a little bit just because it was an elimination diet. I don't think it would have been beneficial for me in the long term, you know, but it eliminated a lot of things like gluten or like added sugars or like high carbs that were not working. So it was a pretty extreme elimination diet. When your body goes into elimination diet, of course, you remove a bunch of the crap. So your body's going to start feeling better. That's why vegans feel better when they first start eating vegan because like they eliminate a bunch of junk food. Hopefully yeah. some don't, <laughs> but most of them do, you know, most Oreo of them eat... is, uh, well, technically vegan. <laughs> is it? Yeah. Right. <laughs> I know many vegans, they eat so terrible. And, you know, I have a vegan friend. I started making her food and like, God forbid, I'm making vegan food for her. That's how much you love your friends, right? Uh-huh. And like, she's like, I never ate so healthy in my life. I'm like, yes, honey, you can be vegan and eat healthy. It's possible. Hard, but possible. <laughs> so I'd like to ask, what has been the key for you finding this path? Um, I know you met people along the way who were, and then you talked about your mom being so open with, you know, an alternative lifestyle. Um, 
when some people would be so fixated with the traditional medicine, um, you were so lucky to have your mom um, and then your mentor. What is it about you that want to find the solution? Was there a distrust in the traditional medicine that has grew? Um, or have you ever looked at traditional medicine to be um, this, you know, company or a big company that just wants to sell? I don't know. That's This is how I feel about them. But um, was there... How, how did your distrust with the medical industry uh, has grown and what have you learned about, about it that you can tell uh, with, with your experience? Yeah, um, I, you know, I think this is just a question of my personal nature mm -hmm. of being, you know, being somebody that doesn't, is like I do have an inquisitive mind and I'm thankfully smart enough that I can smell a lie when somebody tells me a lie and also it's like putting the dots together like you know look at what for example like look at America these days like at what people have been told the kind of advice they have been given for nutrition and then look at the picture of the health of this country people are not healthy at all so if you were following conventional advice that worked then people would be healthy and like they wouldn't be sick and sicker and you know bigger like more and more obese and more and more like diseases like degenerative diseases then you know, we are told that the statistics of like mortality has gone down, people live longer, and that's supposed to make you feel better. But what they don't tell you is that yes, people live longer in assisted living homes, full of medication and confined in a bed or a wheelchair, and the quality of life has gone down like a rock, you know, so it's like, for me, there is a lot of manipulation that is like, manipulation of data, manipulation of statistics, the research is highly manipulated and biased depending on who is funding the research, you know? Those are all things that for me is natural to investigate. I don't just like look at the headlines. It's kind of like, okay, yeah. this is a great analogy. Think about you go to the grocery store and you find a package of like, let's say crackers. And they're like, fat-free, sugar-free, you know, healthy crackers. Then you turn the package and you read the, read the ingredients. And then the first ingredient is aspartame, you know, or cookies, mm -hmm. like they're sugar-free, fat-free cookies. First ingredient is like aspartame. The second ingredient is canola oil. And the third ingredient is bleached enriched wheat flour. And then package says healthy crackers. Mm -hmm. This is the same thing that happens everywhere. And it's the same thing that happens in the medical industry, pharmaceutical industry. You know, just like all these commercials, I don't even own a TV, but you ever, I see a TV and there's commercials for pharmaceuticals, which should just totally be illegal. That's just like, how can even that exist? And then there is all the small print, right? That nobody reads mm -hmm. and it's like, warning, this medication can cause these side yeah. effects. And then there are like four pages of side effects or complications or contraindications. But what do you see? You see, you know, the old woman jumping through the field with her grandchildren all happy. And this is the same thing. It's like that box of cookies where in the front says healthy, but then when you look at the ingredients, they're terrible. Mm. And I think that happens in our conventional health system i don't call it you know mm. it's allopathic medicine for me it's like mm. i'm sorry but it's kind of a joke at this point it's false yeah. advertising it's so sad when i'm not saying to distrust the medical profession in any way because i <laughs> think that it has a place in in in, uh, in health and wellness um but there has been a lot of um, information that has been relayed. Like, for example, um, a friend of mine 
was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. And I asked him, do you know what type 2 diabetes is? And he said, oh, it, it runs in the family. You know, it's no big deal. That, he said it runs in the family. No big deal. He's 30 years old. What, there's no education in this matter, right? Ow. Um, it's, it just tells me that they just are not interested in educating you with this disease that you have. It's called chronic. It's called um, all of these other terminologies. So you could be on meds the rest of your life. They don't know it can be reversed. Why isn't that um, the messaging? Why isn't health be healthy way of living or change in lifestyle be the headline if you have been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes why i don't get that there's no education and you know you talked about you know educating yourself first uh, a lot of people are just trusting of what their doctor is saying to them of what they should do. Oh, you should be on this meds. I know it, it will gradually be worse and worse as, as the years go by, but you, you'll forever be on this medication, right? So um, it's just sad, really. Um, I'd like to dissect this a little deeper for our listeners. You said you discovered, you know, paleo diet and you thought that it was the ultimate healing and you found great success with it. And you thought it was the lifestyle for you. And then um, I think you discovered that one day that you were pre-diabetic. Can you talk a little bit about that and uh, the actions that you've done after? Right. And I was just thinking about that because that relates to the story of your friend. Because guess what? It runs in my family too. And, you know, it's funny because I never really thought about it. But my maternal grandfather died of diabetes. You know, he just didn't wake up one day because he would never, you know, he was taking insulin, but he didn't restrict his diet. He was severely, severely overweight. He ate whatever he wanted. He mm. ate cookies. And mm. He went into a diabetic coma and didn't wake up. And I mean, you know, I should have paid attention to that. But yeah, like when I was already studying nutrition and I was eating paleo diet, like you were saying, and a nutrient dense diet in the style of Western price. And like eating all organic, sustainable. I lived on a homestead. We had this beautiful garden and we had a bunch of fruit trees and, you know, eating a lot of fruit and like drinking wine, you know, making all these like paleo pastries and, and cakes and living large, right? So one day it was like the rude awakening that I measured my blood sugar and it was like way up there, like probably on, you know, between 140, 160, that's well into pre-diabetes almost already, you know, confirmed diabetic too. So I was like, uh oh, <laughs> you know, I should have seen this coming and I didn't. So I understand like sometimes we're so focused on what's in front of us, you know, that you don't, you don't see things that are developing even in your own body. And like, I was gaining weight. I was gaining a lot of weight around, you know, my hips and the middle you know, insulin weight, and then all my joints were hurting, and like, I, my lower back kept going out, you know, I was like, I was flat on my back, like, every couple of months, all those things, you know, whenever even I talked to other people, they were like, oh, no, you're getting old, are you kidding, you're already like 45, 47, like, that's normal, you're getting old, and, you know, like, I was like, no, I was like, nope, yeah. I, I am not accepting that. It's like, it's and like, like your age is an excuse to be sick, right? Right. And that's the norm. Like, if, you know, many patients of mine go to the doctor mm -hmm. and the doctor tells them, oh, that's normal. You're getting old. And then they come to me and I'm like, that is not normal. That is a symptom of something that's happening in your body that is not okay. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, this is when I discovered the ketogenic diet. It was actually because of this ketogenic diet that I was measuring my blood sugar, or I probably wouldn't have found out for another who knows how long. Mm -hmm. So the keto diet really came to me as a lifesaver. And, you know, I had already healed my gallbladder. I had done a bunch of detoxing. I felt like I should have been in the top shape ever, but there was that one thing, one blind spot, mm -hmm. you know, 
And it was like, you can't eat this many carbs. You can't eat this much sugar. You can't drink this much wine because like not just is not healthy for me. And I might, yes, have a genetic predisposition, you know, to sensitivity to carbohydrates or hypersensitive to sugar. And my pancreas maybe is not you know, my genetic profile was like not the best for dealing with sugar, but I think it's just human. Humans are not designed to eat this much sugar. You know, this is something that happened, not just, so, you know, we went from hunter-gatherer to agriculture and then carb intake went up like crazy, health went down, you know, and then like things got worse with the industrial revolution where like foods became more processed and then in the last 50 years after the second world war and the food industry you know came about and like food became highly processed and like you know all these like very high carb high sugar high fat foods bad combination came about like our body started changing mm-hmm. and you really see like I was like um Dr. Sean Baker who's a fellow carnivore you know friend and um he posted a picture of people on the beach in the 70s and there were barely any overweight people. (laughs) You saw that, right? And I was like, wow, you know, that's what, I mean, Italy is still kind of like that. People don't eat as as many hydrogenated or, um, you know, uh, vegetable oils in Italy as they do here. I think that the oils have a big big component in this obesity epidemic Mm. but only like 30 40 years ago we looked very different and why you know and i can see in my body like my body like responds very quickly Mm because i've done so much cleansing detoxing and i've been so strict with my diet for so long that my body is just like really responsive so let's say if i go through a period where like you know, I'm human and things happen in life, right? So sometimes I'm super stressed out, super busy, crazy things happening. You know, I think everybody can relate in 2021 of like being stressed and there is a lot going on out there. And so you might not be like the best at eating. So I will eat more carbs or like sometimes I stress eat because I'm so stressed. I don't know what else to do with myself, you know, um, we are all human and I just see my body immediately changing. And like the way yes. it changes is just so obvious that like, I'm like, okay, this is like the first little step in going down a rabbit hole that I don't want to go into, you know? And luckily with the knowledge that I have, it's really easy to just turn that around and, yeah. you know, get back in control. Cause we are all human and nobody is ever perfect. And just like, but it's really important, I think, to be educated yeah. and know about the options that we have. You know, there's a big mission for me. I think we share the same mission, you and I, cause like, that's what you're yeah. doing through this podcast, <laughs> but yeah. educating yeah. people, right? Empowering people with knowledge so that we can make better choices. I mean, you said it. Um... I think it's a responsibility of everybody that has found a lifestyle that is sustainable. It is our responsibility to share our story, right? And that's why I'm glad that you're here is you're telling your story um, in hopes that maybe somebody would even just consider um, changing their lifestyle and maybe someone resonates with your story and like you said, if not for keto, you would, would have been diabetic, right? If you didn't hear, if there was no keto, you would be down in a rabbit hole. Um, I think it's just, you, you, you touched on it. And, you know, again, being aware, being proactive with your health and being curious of, you know what food can really do to help our body heal is i think the reason why you've become very very successful with this lifestyle completely um and how how long did it take for your sugar you know being on keto starting keto 
go down? Like, when did you realize that, you know, the blood sugar has been normal? When did you realize that? Like, so it took a while for me. I was actually really insulin resistant. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as I was, you know, started doing ketogenic diet and being very strict, I was also working in a practice and being like a patient advocate and detox counselor. So I was working with all these patients and I was seeing people like losing weight really fast and their blood sugars would go down really fast. And for me, it took like at least a good year of being super compliant and, you know, very strict with my diet. And I did lose weight pretty fast. Like I, I gained about 30 pounds from my normal, you know, I've always been pretty thin. Um, but all of a sudden I was like, nothing anymore. And so that reversed pretty quick, but the insulin and the blood sugar, it took longer. So I think it took about a year. And then I still stayed very strict and compliant with my keto diet for three years. And, you know, it, during those three years, it eventually, like I experimented with carnivore mm. and did a whole carnivore experiment for three months. And eventually it started evolving into a more open diet where I am, I call myself meat-based right now. So I eat mostly meat, but I opened up my diet to other things. And I am, you know, I know exactly what I can't eat that's good for me and what I shouldn't eat and stay away from. So what was that transition like from keto to carnivore? What have you realized that carnivore is really good at doing? with your body well you know for me i actually had to experiment with carnivore i it, carnivore was not quite on my radar yet but through a patient that i was working with we you know she started doing carnivore because we were working together we had like a year-long contract and we were working through some pretty major health issues of her and she went from being vegan to vegetarian to paleo and then to keto paleo that, you know, paleo with ketogenic ratios. But there were some things that were not changing and we were just like working around it. And she found the PKD, um, Paleolithic Ketogenic Diet from Hungary. And she's like, I need to try this. I'm going to try this. And I was like, well, you can't be doing something that I have no idea about because that's not... I don't feel responsible, you're under my care. So I need to start doing that too, right away. And so I just jumped in with her. And the funny thing is that um, she had thyroid issues as well and a number of other issues, but our gut environments were really different. And so what happened for her is that the PKD cured her constipation, chronic constipation and like, it started like really being incredibly beneficial for her whole body. Well, for me, I felt good. I felt energized, satiated, like, you know, I felt really good on me, but my gut was not happy. So, you know, what I realized after three months of trying to adapt to being a carnivore is that my gut doesn't want to be a carnivore. And like, because for me as a practitioner, what I understand is that I can use a carnivore diet, it's a great tool, but it also doesn't have to be for everybody. Not everything is for everybody. And you know, carnivore is a great elimination diet. Everybody could do it for a short period of time, but it's not necessarily the lifestyle that we all need for long-term. So, you know, I did it for three months and like, it wasn't always easy for me because like, I was like, my gut is like, Mm -hmm. nope <laughs> we're not doing this <laughs> uh, i think i believe that you know whether you're a carnivore or keto or anything in between i think the most important thing is it is something that you can sustain right because that's the number one thing if you're you can't be on a diet let's say you've been diagnosed with this and you're going to be on this diet for a week it doesn't make sense because if, if you can't sustain that diet, then it doesn't make sense for you to be on that diet, right? So I think for just knowing what works for you, um, what was, what's your diet like right now? What, what does it consist of? 
So right now I eat mostly, I eat a lot of meat, red meat. Um, I eat mostly ruminants, so beef and lamb. I do not eat pork. I stopped eating pork completely three years ago, almost four years ago. And this is both for, I started out for health reasons and then now it's for spiritual reasons. But um, I do eat fish. I don't eat so much fish anymore. Like fish is a treat, honestly, because of, you know, health reasons again, like mercury and heavy metals and sustainability and all of that. It's not easy to eat fish these days. Um, and I do eat veggies and small amounts of fruit. You know, I'm, like I say, I'm very in tune with my body. Like I know that like, for example, summer and I love like watermelon. I love watermelon, but if I have more than like one little piece like this of watermelon, it will literally make me jittery. So I am so sensitive to sugar that I will feel it instantly and start being like jacked up from the sugar and it's like nope can't do it you know so I have to be because my body is so sensitive and my body is so responsive I know instantly like you know and I I have to stay away from the things that are bad for me because they make me feel really bad and I usually feel really good I have really you know great energy and despite of menopause and all the craziness of quarantine and the craziness of my home life you know I still maintain great levels of energy and like mm. you know I'm never sick um it just feels good like I wake up in the morning yeah. and I'm like ready to go you know so when you eat something that doesn't agree with me I yeah. know immediately and I definitely avoid gluten and grains those don't even really come in question unless yeah. it's like I'm cheating you, and I know, you know it what? and it's intentional you know what? <laughs> that's the one thing that I don't get right so I'm the same when I eat something and I suddenly don't feel good then it's only you know common sense to point to that food to not be good for me Right, so I the, the thing that I don't get is why don't people realize that? Like, what what do you think about that? Why don't people be like, you know, more aware of what food may, does to them? Like, why are we so aware that when you said that when you cheat, right, you feel it right away? Why why mm -hmm. don't they feel that way? Do you I think, think they're two reasons two main reasons that I can think of the first one is that people most people that have been eating a standard American diet are very toxic mm -hmm. and their inflammation levels are high and they just don't feel good all the time mm -hmm. and because they're so used to not feeling good you normalize that good point. so they can't they don't even know what it means to feel good like truly good and you know why I know this because my patients tell me all the time. <laughs> and once I start cleaning wow. them up and like we do all this work and yeah. they're like, wow, like I didn't know I could feel this good again. I feel like I'm in my twenties again. Wow. I didn't know how bad I felt until I feel good. Is so it that's like, one big reason. Is it like you don't realize it until you done it? Did that, is, would that be the same thing? Um, right. If you did if you don't know, like you said, like your patient would say they they don't they didn't know they could feel this way, then a lot of people that are on the standard naked diet really doesn't know how to feel good anymore, right? Um, exactly. Just you know, being you know, their upbringing may be a part of it, right? You were so lucky to have been um, in you know. A fa in, in a family that is really open-minded with you know alternative medicine but some people are not so lucky right um you see right. uh children's food right um cereals <laughs> everything um starting starting like starting when you were a kid where you just fed by sugar all the time and you really know. don't know what to feel anymore right so um it's just uh 
the, th the reason why what, what I find is until you until your health fails and until you are fed up, you wouldn't know how to look for the lifestyle for you. I don't know. It's it's just me because I talk to a lot of people in this podcast and a lot of them have really been had their backs against the wall and they said enough was enough. Uh, yeah. There must be something else. There must be uh, uh, a way out of this when traditional medicine isn't working anymore. Um, man, I, I just I just want to know how to communicate this to other people and because it's hard right when you say when you tell somebody that's been on this standard make and diet for a long time when you say oh um you know you are what you eat right what does that even mean for them right um you you would be so you would feel so good on this diet you know how do you communicate that with your clients like let's say somebody um reach out to you that have this you know maybe the same um illness that you had and just doesn't know what to do how do you communicate this to them and just um where do you start then well i think that there is something here i would like to say that it's kind of sad but i i it's sad but it's not sad it's just what it is mm. you know they say you can lead a horse to water but you can't make him drink exactly. and like these kind of realizations are very deep personal realizations and this is what also makes us human humans are all different we all have a different path we all have a different evolutionary path we all have different preferences and different choices and that's the privilege and the prerogative of being human i guess because animals don't have that you know mm -hmm. you never seen a lion say i'm gonna go vegan because i think it's better for the planet mm -hmm. a lion will instinctively just do what's best what nature told him to do for his health for his well-being a lion will eat meat because he's designed to eat meat mm -hmm. And it will just continue eating meat. It doesn't matter, like it doesn't think about it. It, you know, just like a gazelle will eat grass and continue to eat grass because grass is the best for a gazelle. If a gazelle could not eat meat. Yeah. But as humans, we have this frontal lobe thinking part here, you know, there is this new part of our brain. And here we're going to a really huge topic of like, you know what is it to be human really and like you know i think we sometimes get very like side blinders mm -hmm. for this and forget that the human experience is one that is extremely varied it's extremely changeable and you know even though i look at evolution and i look okay we evolved for hundreds of thousands of years eating this kind of stuff we did great you know humans were strong smart capable and then we change we eat this that stuff and we got shorter and weaker and kind of stupider sorry yeah. <laughs> you know so you know you make statistics in your head it's like well yeah. it makes sense to me then that i want to eat like the strong guys and smart guys not like the short skinny thick guys yeah. you know and like why did humans start eating creating agriculture that's mm -hmm. a big question right why yeah. did we do that why do we stop being hunter gatherers? Because mm -hmm. there were other advantages to that. So the human experience cannot be confined to the box of like black and white. Oh, because this is good for me, so I'm gonna do it. You know, mm -hmm. I wish we were so much easier, right? Mm -hmm. But things are so much more nuanced and so much more complex. So like we need to look at you know, our belief systems, our limiting beliefs, our traumas, mm -hmm. you know, our ideology, our fear, where is it, our trust in life and trust in nature, mm -hmm. our trust in God, like, there is so much here. So you can just tell people, yeah, you look at the internet space, everybody is like, do this, it's gonna save you, it's gonna be great for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have the information in this day and age, information is not lacking. Yeah. But 
what's behind our ability to make the right choices it's a yeah. whole other can of worms right there yeah <laughs> and it's so hard to break those habits right um like for example i would be i would i'm not perfect i would you know cheat sometimes and when you go back into that habit i know you feel so bad after um but it just it's just it's so there's something in your brain that turns on where you crave those stuff again right um it's so hard and that's from like one day of cheating right how about this the people that have been on this diet for many many years doesn't even know how to break that habit i think that's really important and i really believe that we can't force anyone to change their diet they have to find you they have to find your website they have to have a reason for them to to look for you um whatever that reason may be right to find this podcast to find and sometimes it happens when help fails them um or you know they have this burning desire to find other solutions but it doesn't come naturally to people right it's not common knowledge to people that there is an alternative now we could be so trusting with the medical establishment they could be so trusting with oh you could be on this medication for the rest of your life but you'll be okay right so it's just you know finding like you said information and information is there for you you just got to be careful of what information you absorb um but it is there right it is there and you can be better but you got to make that first step. You got to break that habit. That's the hardest part is starting, right? Starting this um, journey, right? When does that journey start for you, right? Your journey started when you were a kid. You were curious. You were, you had your mom, you had, um, you had, you know, ex experiences along the way. You, you were diagnosed with, uh, you know, gut disease or um, that made you proactive. That's, but the difference is you were proactive, you were curious, you were aware that there is an alternative. But for some people, even though they've been diagnosed with this same uh, disease, they, would, they wouldn't be looking for another solution. And so that's what I want to do that's why you're here. That's why you're telling this story. And I think it's more powerful than anything else is having the experiences uh, told, right? And so I'm really grateful for you. If you wanna grab uh, Vivica's uh, book, The Essential Carnival Cookbook, um, it's, uh, it's at the nourishedcaveman.com, right? Mm -hmm. Is that right? And uh, yeah. Vivica Minegas on YouTube and at the Nourish Cayman on IG. This has been a blast, Vivica. Thank you so much once again for coming on and sharing your story. Um, I really appreciate you. And uh, wow, lots of information here, Vivica. Thank you so much. Your uh, wealth of experience and knowledge. And I'm really glad that your website, your platform is, is available for people that want to make a change, right? So. Thank you so much for you. I appreciate your Thank time you. and uh, we'll talk soon, okay? Thank you, Lauren. Thank you for having me here. Thank you so much. Have a great day, all right? Bye-bye.